Welcome everybody to our Monday, our Tuesday. What day is today? Tuesday, live and I uh, and uh, listen. We we have so many different things that are going on, but I want to make sure that today what we're going to do is help everybody un to understand some things that we need to understand because right now I think most of us who actually care, we feel helpless. Like what, what else can we do? What should we be doing? So we're going to get into that and hopefully give you some tools. We also want to make sure that you're encouraged and lifted up uh, because it's the constant barrage of some very difficult things that we keep hearing on the, uh, on the news. Uh, listen, before we get going, I also want to just let you know this. Everything that we do here at Hope For Our Times, um, all the videos, all the conferences, going to Europe, going into Mexico, uh, even Australia, all of wherever we go, we look at those things as mission opportunities. What we do right here on a daily basis is uh, as, uh, because of your partnership with us. And I just want to thank you guys for that. We could not do it without you guys uh, just joining us and partnering with us. And we're not funded by any church or anything like that. And, uh, nobody else supports us. It's just you guys. I want to thank you as we continue to bring the truth into the world, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And um, so we're going to get going because right now we need hope, but we're going to look at some things and uh, we're going to get going. So please welcome our guest today, Britt Gillette. Britt, thank you for coming back on the program. It's been a while since you've, since you've been on here and this is great having you join me. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thank you. So much is going on, Britt. I know when we first had you scheduled to be here today, we're going to be talking about different things. Obviously, the dynamic has completely changed. And um, Britt, I am looking at the, the, the horror of uh, just you know waking up to the news today and the slaughter of these babies, babies being burned, um, babies being beheaded. I mean, I can't even think of these things. There's, 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 these things are just turning our stomach. Um, and I want to get to... Uh, Isaiah chapter 17, will this lead to the destruction of Damascus? But uh, Britt, as I, as I look at these different atrocities that are happening, I, I want to go somewhere where you were talking about just before we came on, is something we need to do. Um, and we're also going to get into the great hope that we have too. I want to spend a lot of time there today. But something we need to do is, is not forget as we watch what's happening because the tendency of human beings is to forget, move on, and in this case, even worse. What are your, some of your thoughts? That's correct. I think, you know, we were talking about how a lot of people are comparing what happened this weekend in Israel and what's still going on to September 11th and those terrorist attacks. And not to minimize September 11th, but this is much bigger when you look at you know, the United States has 30 times the population of Israel so this would be, imagine if you live in, in California or Arizona, you woke up one morning on the weekend and terrorists were pouring over the border of Mexico into your neighborhoods, shooting your children in front of you, you know, chasing down cars with, you know, mom taking her kids to soccer practice and shooting the whole family, you know, killing people, burning houses, on and on, you, people can read the news stories, but imagine that there were 30,000, more than 30,000 murdered Americans in one weekend as a result of that, and 100,000 people injured. That's the scale of what Israel has experienced, and this is still ongoing. And so we have to understand just what this is. Do not forget, let that image stay in your mind, that imagination. What if this was where I lived, whatever country you live in, and then what would you expect the response of your, what would you expect the response from your government to be to make sure that the border is secure and you're safe? Because Israel is going to have to undertake the effort to make sure that that happens. We're talking as the, right now there's a lot of world leaders coming out and saying we stand with Israel earlier, just a few hours ago, President Biden came out and said, I stand with Israel. But 
two weeks from now, when all the images are plastered all over the worldwide media of the suffering that's taking place in Gaza as a result of Israel having to do what it needs to do to eliminate this terrorist threat, are we still going to have President Biden and all these other world leaders standing with Israel, or will we hear calls for an end to this disproportionate response, this has to stop, are we going to see Israel turn from the victim to the aggressor? And I believe we're going to see a full-on propaganda blitz to make exactly that happen, and they're going to call for a halt to any operation to end this terrorist threat, and we need to be standing up against that. Yeah, Israel is in such a bad place. I mean, they've tried to uh, work with the international community on these terrorists, because that's what they are. Uh, these terrorists are well-funded. Uh, money comes from the United States through different avenues, um, even with the digital currency, as we were reading earlier. But we look at, at all of this is taking place, it's escalating, and I personally believe Israel has to deal with it. It's like a once and for all. Uh, but as I look to the future, and, and I think of things like Isaiah chapter 17, the destruction of Damascus, Psalm 83, Brett, I'd like to ask your question on that because in Isaiah chapter 17, I believe it's a prophecy still coming where it appears from reading the text, Israel, the Israel, Israeli military eliminates Damascus. And the way the Bible reads is eliminates them at, during the night. Uh, in the evening, Damascus is struck. In the morning, she is no more. And you, so we look, we think, okay, Hezbollah, there's, there's some rumors now that Hezbollah is involved from the north, uh, unable to confirm that at this point. But I'm looking at this going, could this escalate to the point of the fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 17 and uh, Psalm 83, the people, there's uh, prophecy teachers that believe Psalm 83 is a, a prophetic passage that will be literally fulfilled. Uh, others say it's just a prayer but your thoughts on what we see, because I think this has to get to a point where Israel gets control and eliminates the terrorist threats. Sure. I think, you know, time will tell how this all plays out, regardless of whether this is a specific conflict that's outlined in Bible prophecy. I think it's indicative of the times in which we live. It's very clear we are approaching the tribulation period, the second coming of Christ, and that means the rapture of the church is even sooner. So it's critical now more than ever that people come to know Jesus if they don't already. But in regard to could this play out into the fulfillment of Isaiah 17, I too believe that is a prophecy of a future event. And Damascus is the longest continuously inhabited city on the planet that, that we know of. And so this, I, I don't see how this has been fulfilled, but there are people who take uh, a different point of view who are good Bible prophecy scholars. So maybe they're right, maybe I'm wrong. I know that I know this, the Bible is 100% accurate and perfect. My interpretation of it is not, because I'm, <laughs> I'm not perfect. But based on my research, I believe that not only Isaiah 17, but I believe that Psalm 83 is also a future war, and the two are intimately linked, I believe. If you look at verses, uh, uh, if you look at Psalm 83, verse 13, and Isaiah 17, verse 13, you have in, the, in Psalm 83, Asaph making a prayer of what God should do to it, it, Israel's enemies. And then in Psalm 80, uh, or I'm sorry, in Isaiah 17, verse 13, we have God saying, I'm doing these things. So they're almost word for word if you look at the original text of what is taking place. So I believe those two, and, and when we read Psalm 83, we see these quotes that are right out of the headlines from the past hundred years of, you know, come let us wipe away Israel as a nation so that nobody hears of it anymore. Let us come take these pasture lands for ourselves. Who cares about their God? All of the things we've been hearing for decades, we've, you know, it, to me, we're, we're going to see that fulfilled at some point in the future. Is this it? I do not know, but I think that we see a scenario 
taking place right now where easily we could see that play out. We had Hezbollah say that if Israel launched a ground invasion into Gaza, that they would declare war on Israel. And then you would have war on Israel's northern border. You would have you know, Damascus as this hotbed of terrorism, place where Hezbollah and Iran are facing their terrorist operations. So if Israel faces an existential threat, I believe they wouldn't think twice about doing what they had to do. And if that means the destruction of Damascus, I think that's what we would see. Yeah, uh, and certainly what Israel has is also what they call the Samson option. If it looks sure. like we're going to be eliminated, we will do all that we can, even if it means the end of themselves uh, to eliminate the, the enemy. Um, when I think of this in Psalm 83 also, these are just some of the words, everybody, from what uh, Britt was saying. Uh, in verse 4, they have said, Come, let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be remembered no more, which is what Britt was saying. We're hearing, we're hearing it all the time. So that's Psalm 83, written by Asaph thousands of years ago. Uh, and then you have over in Isaiah chapter 17, the verse that's almost identical, as you said, to verse 13 in, in Psalm 83. Here it is, verse 13 in Isaiah 17. The nations will rush like the rushing of many waters, but God will rebuke them and they will flee far away and be chased like the chaff of the mountains before the wind, like a rolling thing before the whirlwind. Then behold, at eventide trouble and before the morning, Damascus is no more. This is the portion of those who plunder us and the lot of those who rob us. So here in verse 13, it describes exactly what you said. It has, it pictures all these different groups coming against the nation of Israel. And that is exactly what they're threatening. God says, bring them on. I am going to eliminate them. I'm going to deal with this, this problem. Uh, another thing that's interesting also, when you look at, there's a difference between Psalm 83 in Ezekiel chapter 38. Psalm 83 is like a circle around the nation of Israel, like an inner circle. In Ezekiel chapter 38, when you see the nations that are invading Israel, none of them are in that inner circle, which, which right. gives some thought to, well, what happens to the inner circle prior to Ezekiel chapter 38? It appears that they're eliminated because it seems Ezekiel 38 would include not just uh, uh, Magog, but also not just Russia, uh, uh, Iran, Persia, and Turkey, but also it would include Hezbollah and Hamas and all of these other immediate joining terrorist groups. Ezekiel 38 doesn't appear to do that, so if that be the case, then these groups will be eliminated, and, and, it, and I, I think it's going to go that direction because also a Brit, the way I read so, uh, Ezekiel chapter 38 is that battle doesn't take place until Israel is dwelling in peace and security. They are definitely not there yet. And, um, <laughs> and so this is something that's happening first. And my guess is, like you said, might not be Isaiah chapter 17 right now, might not be Psalm 83 right now, but I'm looking going, it, everything is going that direction, but time will tell. Right. Yeah. I mean, you took the words right out of my mouth because some people have been asking, is this the fulfillment of the Gog of Magog war in Ezekiel 38, 39? And I think we can definitively say no, because we know that when that takes place, it says Israel is dwelling securely in a, in a sense of tranquility, yeah. meaning they feel no threat. And so if you had a scenario like we just outlined where Psalm 83 is a war and Isaiah 17 is this future fulfillment. And these terrorist groups were eliminated from Israel's immediate borders. You would have these buffer zones that would give Israel that sense of peace and tranquility. And as you said, then the other nations, the other enemies that are left of Israel would be this sort of outer ring of nations that isn't what we're seeing today as the critical threat to Israel's security on its immediate borders. Yeah. Um, also, it's it's no surprise to us, and uh, but Egypt is not allowing any of the people from Gaza to escape there. Israel is warning we are going to level Gaza. 
uh, and the civilians need to be let out. But Egypt doesn't want them. And, they're, and what they're doing, instead they're flipping and saying, see, you're just going to kill all these, all these families. That's what you're going to do. So we can already see the shaping of the narrative of what is going to come. Egypt doesn't want them. Uh, and uh, they had the opportunity back in 1948 uh, to be able to uh, become Israeli citizens if they wanted to. But they were talked to by their Arab community, said, no, you don't have to do that. We're going to eliminate Israel from the map and then you'll be able to dwell there. Well, it didn't work out that way. And they could have been an Israeli citizen way back then, but you look at the whole thing, the, the Palestinian people are used like pawns. Hamas uses them as human shields. Egypt doesn't want them. Jordan doesn't want them. Syria never wanted them. Uh, nobody wanted them. Israel attempted to give them a place to live. Uh, prior to Hamas taking over Gaza, back when Israel still had Gaza, go back to the early 2000s, they still had Gaza. Gaza was actually a place that was starting to show some promise. And then through the pressure from the international community, Gaza was turned over to what it has become. And that was the fear Israel had. It's, it is just a massive hotbed of, of radical terrorists. Right, and I think, you know, we can see this This issue is going to come to the forefront. In fact, it's already coming to the forefront because I saw an article earlier today where they said, well, Israel told the people in Gaza to leave, but now they're bombing the only way out. And so, again, we're going to see a full court press of propaganda that transforms Israel from the victim in this circumstance to the aggressor. And they're going to be calling for a halt to any incursions into Gaza. They're going to be calling to an end from this violence. And think about if we were to see the scenarios that we just talked about, if we were to see the destruction of Damascus, what would be the cry from the international community? Right? So the Jewish people said never again after the Holocaust. And I believe they will stand by that and do what they need to do to defend the nation of Israel. But the world is not going to like that and what that means because the enemy has made it clear what they are willing to do. And they've put Israel into this position where they only have one way to act, and that is to eliminate the threat. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting to note, Charles Feinberg wrote in his commentary many years ago about the prophecies of Zechariah from the Old Testament regarding all the nations will be against Israel. And he wrote this, as a portion of the prophetic scriptures, this section of Zechariah is second to none in importance in this book or in any other Old Testament book. He writes, it is indispensable to an understanding of the events of the last days for Israel. Uh, then he goes on and says, in the time of our passage, all the nations of the earth will be bitten by the virus of anti-Semitism. And, and as I look at that, Britt, that looks like what you're describing, I'm convinced is going to happen. The narrative is going to be extreme against Israel and against the Jewish people, so much so that, listen, everybody, I encourage you to be strong now because three weeks out, four weeks out, five weeks out, however long it is, uh, if you stand with Israel, you are going to be publicly shamed. If, if, you're, if you're like us, you're going to be publicly shamed. If you put an Israeli flag on your house, you will be, you're going to be ridiculed. Uh, who knows what else is going to happen? But anti-Semitism is going to increase. And, and we know that the nature of people, but God warned us, this is one of the most significant signs of the last days. Right. Yeah. And we talked earlier at the beginning about people feeling helpless about watching what's happening, how terrible these events are. And, you know, not all of us can engage in this conflict on, on the field of battle, but we all have an important role to play. One, we can pray. Everybody should be praying for the peace of Jerusalem, not just here and now, but for what that means and that Jesus comes back and reigns from his throne in Jerusalem. 
We should be praying for justice. We should be praying for those who are innocent in all of this. You know, all these children that are involved in this, this conflict, it's, it's, it's terrible. It shows the fallen world that we live in, that we all need Jesus. So we need to be praying that God uses these events to bring people closer to him and bring people to Jesus. So we need to be praying. I think we also need to understand we're all critical foot soldiers in an information war. In modern warfare, the information war is just as important as what's happening on the battlefield because reality does not matter if the world's perception is something different. If the world has a perception of this conflict that's one thing, reality won't matter. So in the face of this, we need to stand for truth and for righteousness. Just as you said, we need to be preparing ourselves right now for the spiritual battle that's going to come because, as you said, everyone who stands with Israel is going to be a target. They're going to be ostracized. They're going to do everything they can to keep you from speaking up and telling the truth about why all of this is happening and what just happened. And we need to make sure that we stand tall with Israel. Uh, yes, we do. Uh, Britt, you had mentioned being an influencer because really every, every Christian is an influencer. Um, we're all called to be salt and light in the world. And typically in the Christian life, we look at, okay, I need to be righteousness in the community. You bring it to the school board and, and wherever. You, you, every single Christian will influence other people for good or for bad, depending on your own testimony. In this case, uh, we, we're all influencers um, like salt and light. And in this case, we can look at it with Israel. And, and, and there's many people out there that are going to push back and say, what's up with Israel and you, you crazy prophecy people? Listen, every, the reason we're, we talk about Israel is there's several different reasons, but one of them is because God's covenant with Abraham. And he had a covenant with Abraham for the land that was for the Jewish people. It's, a, it's an everlasting covenant. Also the Messianic covenant. Jesus came uh, from the Jewish people. And we recognize this. And Jesus, as he came the first time, he's also going to come back again. But with this, we, we have, uh, so we talk about Israel. Israel's God's timepiece. Everything culminates there. Uh, interesting, Britt, you mentioned Psalm 122, praying for the peace of Jerusalem, ultimately praying for Jesus to come back. The verse before, pray for the peace of Jerusalem, says this in verse 5 of Psalm 122, for thrones are set there, that be Jerusalem. Thrones are set in Jerusalem for judgment, the thrones of the house of David. I'm thinking the enemy knows his judgment is coming. So Jerusalem is the target. Antichrist is going to attempt to usurp the authority of Jesus. It's not going to work. So he's going to sit in a temple and demand to be worshipped as God. But judgment is coming and he knows it. And I also believe he knows he doesn't have a lot of time left. So we see this increase of all this that is happening. But again, folks, I, I want to encourage you just with the words that Britt shared is we, we need to be resolute in our minds right now. Uh, you, we, you can't expect to have a positive reaction three weeks out in favor of Israel with the pressure that it, it is going to come, uh, the, the pressure to not stand with Israel. Uh, and it's, it's being resolved now to understand the biblical case uh, that is made for the nation of Israel. God, you know, I've, uh, Brit, I'm seeing all kinds of anti-Zion, anti-Semitism. We've had more anti-Semitic comments on our on our chats than we've ever had before over the last two days, last three days, this will increase. But God is the original Zionist. Zion is his. He repeats it over and over in the Bible. Well, the way I figure it is, if God's a Zionist, I wanna be on God's side. So likewise, I am also a Christian Zionist. And boy, does that enrage people. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I want to share this, these two verses that I ran across today while I was reading the Bible. This is from Isaiah chapter 41, verses 9 through 10. God says, I've called you back from the ends of the earth. So he's talking about the modern day nation of Israel, saying, you are my servant, for I've chosen you, and I will not throw you away. Don't be afraid, for I am with you. 
Don't be discouraged, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. As this is a spiritual battle, first and foremost, and that's why it's critical, the role that we play. And we know that even if the whole world is against us, God is on our side. God is on Israel's side. And that's all that matters, guys. That's what's in the end. And, and there are dark times ahead. But in the end, God will be victorious. Amen. Uh, l let me go here for a few minutes with you because, I mean, every day, all day long now, it's just discouraging news. It's hard. It's difficult. As you mentioned, people feel helpless. People are even feeling hopeless. People are going through all kinds of anxiety and fear. Uh, even it's affecting the Christian community. It's affecting people who study Bible prophecy. Although in Bible prophecy, we, we, we are given signs. Still seeing these things is, is difficult. But our hope, we have such great hope. And we have a message that the whole world needs. Uh, we have the hope of the Lord Jesus Christ. There, there's going to be a trumpet that's going to sound. We're going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And the tribulation doesn't begin until after we are caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And so we're not in the tribulation yet. But we, we, we have such great hope. And we can influence other people just by sharing the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. That this world is not our home. And this is bad stuff here. But, uh, but we have a home that the Lord has prepared for us. It's called heaven. Yes, yeah. And in fact, you were talking earlier about, you know, why, why is Satan, why are the forces of evil aligned against the Jewish people? Why is there all this anti-Semitism? One of the reasons is salvation comes through the Jews. That's from John chapter 4, verse 22. That's Jesus talking to the woman at the well. And the salvation that comes through the Jews is Jesus Christ himself, the Messiah, came and died for our sins. So Jesus was telling her in that passage, he said, you know, the people who drink from this well will grow thirsty again, but the people who drink the water I give them will never thirst again. So Jesus is our hope. He's our answer. We, All of this conflict we see, it's an indication of, the times in which we live and a sign that we're approaching the tribulation period, but it's also just indicative of a fallen world filled with sin. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death. We're all sinners. We're all born that way. But the good news is that while we were still sinners, Jesus Christ came to earth. He lived a perfect sinless life. He died on the cross and shed his blood as forgiveness for our sins so that we could be reconciled with God and have eternal life and be in heaven. There is a greater day coming. Amen. Again, I would encourage people to read Psalm 22 in its entirety, as I believe that passage gives us a glimpse into the world that is yet to come where Jesus has returned and rules from Jerusalem on his throne and all the nations will stream there to give homage to the Lord so the guys there's darkness right now it's going to get worse unfortunately because as you said we're not in the tribulation period it's known as the time of jacob's trouble and jesus said that time will be worse than any since nations first came into existence that's a very sobering thought when you think about holocaust and world war ii all the horrible terrible things that have happened on earth because the good news is that Jesus came. He died for us. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Through him we have life, and there is a new day coming. There is an end to this age that will come. Jesus is coming back, and when he does, we will experience all the promises <laughs> of his kingdom, and all of this, will, all these tears will be wiped away. Amen. So that's the good news. Amen. I think of uh, the description that the Bible gives in a couple of different places. Paul describes uh, the events of the last days and birth pains upon a pregnant woman. And, and uh, Jesus himself said, these are the beginning of sorrows, also a reference to birth pains. So increasing the frequency and intensity. So as you look back over the last few years, 
you can see how things were increasing in frequency and intensity, but now uh, they're in a place where we've never quite imagined this before. And the focus is on Israel, the enemies of Israel converging on Israel. Israel will have the victory in this, but there's still uh, more coming in the future. But our hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Britt, I, I also think of this, and this gives me great joy. When you look at what is happening on this planet, whether it be the planet of the globalists like the Klaus Schwab's and the Kissingers or whoever, or you look at the events that are taking place right now coming from uh, the, the, these terrorist organizations, listen, they're building, they're trying to build their utopian world. The globalists, their utopian world with their Western thought. The terrorists, their utopian world with their body that's going to rule by violence, by the way. That's how they're going to take the kingdom, by violence. In fact, Hamas, the word means violence. That's what it is. So they're trying to build their heaven on earth. And uh, praise God that for the believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, this is as close as we're ever going to get to hell, this planet, because we have heaven. This is as close as they're ever going to get to heaven, is what they're building on this earth. And it's their thought with, with these radical terrorist organizations, they want to eliminate Christians and Jews. That's the only way they can experience the heaven they want. And you can start working that out with other people. So we don't, their, their, uh, their future is, is judgment from God. And they need the Lord Jesus Christ. But in, in all of this, Brit, I look at uh, 1 Corinthians 15, in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we are all going to be changed. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, at the sound of the trumpet, at the shout, uh, the dead in Christ will rise, and we who are alive and remain will be caught up together to meet the Lord of the air. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Few verses later, Paul goes on and says, he says, but when they say peace and safety, uh, sudden destruction will come upon them, and they shall not escape. So Paul has two different groups of people, those who are caught up, and then those who are left behind, they won't escape. And we, we, we take comfort in that knowing we can see this, but we have opportunity right now to be influencers. And so this is the direct, we're going to influence and know that our future is great, difficult now, but much more difficult in the future for those who are left behind. Oh, horrific, ab absolutely, way worse than what this world is going through right now. We have such joy to look forward to. Yes, I, I want to build on what you just said. I mean, it, everyone is an influencer. I know a lot of people out there sit back and think, well, I'm not some pastor with a huge congregation, or I'm not on television, or I don't have a big Instagram following. But everyone is an influencer to their family, friends, coworkers, neighbors, all the people you come in contact with. Guys, we need to be spreading truth about what's going on in Israel, but also the good news of Jesus Christ. And the good, the good thing, the silver lining in all of these events that are taking place is it gives us a great opportunity to point to these various events and tell people about what's happening. Hey, did you know the Bible foretold all of these things? The Bible said this would happen. I've said in the past when people are standing in line to buy you know, some Starbucks or something at Walmart, you see somebody use cash, just tell them, hey, you better enjoy using that while you can. Well, what do you mean? Well, they're, they're trying to eliminate cash. They want to institute these central bank digital currencies. Oh, you know, I've heard some of that. And you know, the Bible foretold that 2000 years ago, <laughs> you know, just plant that seed. Even if that person puts an immediate wall up and doesn't want to speak to you anymore, You've planted that seed, and no doubt, when that time comes that they're experiencing that and they can't use cash anymore, they'll remember what you said, and they'll say, that was in the Bible. What else does the Bible say? Oh, the Bible also foretold the birth, the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth, our Messiah. So ultimately, that's where everybody needs to go. That's the good news that we need to be telling everybody about, Revelation says, for all prophecy is to give a clear witness to Jesus. Amen. You know, I've been cautioning people, warning them for some time now that uh, there's a lot of people that get into Bible prophecy 
and they get excited by it or whatever it may be, um, or they're just alerted to things so they're able to go there. But the problem is, if you don't know Jesus, who came the first time, then all of these things that you're learning with Bible prophecy are only going to be used in judgment against you because you can see the prophetic word coming true. You can see how it's all going to be fulfilled, and much of it already has been fulfilled. Listen, you need, you need to know Jesus Christ. He came to forgive us of our sins, and, and uh, this, the things that are taking place aren't for entertainment or just to make you uh, just to make you excited or whatever the purpose is. It's, it's not that. It's all, all the signs need to point us to Jesus. In fact, Jesus himself said of this, uh, let me read this passage, Mark chapter 13. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Take heed, watch and pray, for you do not know when the time is. It is like a man going to a far country who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to each his work and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. Watch therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming in the evening, at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say to you, I say to all, watch. So we should be watching, but ultimately what we can't forget is all of the signs point to Jesus. Signs always point to something. A stop sign tells you something you need to do. A road sign that says curve ahead tells you it's a bridge out. It, they all signs tell us something. So all these signs, they point us, oh, Jesus, he's coming again. There were signs of his first coming, and Jesus chastised the religious leaders for not paying attention to them, even though they knew them, because he said, hey, if you would have been, you, you guys know the word, you knew the signs, you know now would be the time of my visitation. Likewise with us, we can look and go, okay, watch. They're pointing to Jesus, and, and, we, and for us who are believers, it is such a, great hope. So I want to encourage you guys, do your best to not be discouraged, but encouraged as you keep your eyes fixed on Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. Yeah. Yeah. So Jesus said, when you see all these things begin to happen, look up, your salvation draws near. And that when he's, what he's telling us to watch for, you know, in that parable, it's not just, well, you could watch and be a lazy servant too, but you're supposed to watch and so that you, when he comes back, you're found doing what you're supposed to be doing, what he sent you out into the world to do. So we should be clear witnesses for the good news of Jesus Christ. We should be, you know, spreading love and hope to those around us. And we should be doing, we should be praying constantly so we should be standing for righteousness and truth so we should be doing everything we can to be as grounded in the scriptures i can't can't under underscore that enough that every day you need to be reading the bible because we live in this world where we have just this constant inundation of all these different media signals and messages coming at us that could drown all of that out and a whole lot of deception too as we see with search engines and social media and how we know that's been engineered to give us certain outputs as the word of god is the truth we can stand on and we need to be grounded in that that's how you arm yourself and equip yourself and continuously improve yourself <laughs> to be the best you can be as we see that time coming. You know, Paul talked about life as a race, and I believe we, we can see the finish line. With all these signs we see, we can see the finish line. I don't know how far away it is, right? I know, I know it's in view. How much longer do I have to go? I don't know, but it's not the time to sit down and rest. It's not the time to take a water break. It's not the time to quit. It's the time to full out sprint, do everything you can to live for Jesus and to spread that message of hope to a lost and dying world that needs him. I mean, again, these events should underscore how lost the world is and how much they need Jesus. Amen. Uh, Bonnie Creighton commented here. She said, uh, 
uh, occupy until he comes. And that's everything that you are talking about. I think of Peter, 2 Peter chapter 3, where Peter writes, uh, therefore, since all these things will be talking about uh, all the judgments coming and the new heaven and new earth, therefore, what manner of person ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? And, uh, uh, and so I look at all of this, what do we need to do? We, we should be praying for the peace of Jerusalem, encouraging the Israelis, um, supporting them, however that may be. But one of the things, like you said, just the practical ways that we can do that right now, be an influencer. Um, uh, everybody is an influencer. Some have social media, some don't. But we can be an influencer, and we got to be we, we got to be strong now. Uh, and be prepared now for all that is coming because it's going to be very difficult. Uh, there will be a lot of pressure to not stand with the people of Israel in the very near future. This will go through. Israel will be victorious in this, but the pressure against Israel is going to be very difficult. And as Jill Newman says here, stand on the word. Amen. Hey, again, I want to thank everybody for uh, your support, without your support, we can't do what we do here and uh, be able to minister. We literally are ministering all over the world now, uh, going there in person, ministering, and also uh, uh, through the different platforms that are through the app and YouTube, uh, Facebook, and uh, the different podcasts that we have. I just want to thank all you guys uh, for being such a, a blessing to us and partnering with us and helping us. Uh, like I said earlier, we're not supported by a church or anything else. And so thank you very much. It's very helpful and encouraging. Britt, thank you for uh, being a blessing to us today. Do um, you have any final closing thoughts? Well, I was just thinking about one of the comments you just read about Occupy till he comes. And I think it's never been more important. We realize from the events of this past weekend that are ongoing right now, one of the things that I've heard for years is when I've written articles or made videos, people will say, well, yeah, but we're going to be gone before that happens. And there are many people that are focused on the rapture as their savior rather than Jesus. Uh, right. And right. so, yes, we should be living as if Jesus will return at any moment, but at the same time, we need to occupy as if it will be a whole lifetime. Right. We need to be, and, and that's hard for some people to hold into their minds, but we are not guaranteed that we won't experience trials and tribulations, just the opposite. Jesus said we would. Now, that doesn't mean we'll experience the tribulation, but the world is a fallen place, and we are experiencing those things right now, and we need to be occupying every moment, no matter how long it is until the Lord returns, we need to be making the most of the time we have. Excellent. Very well said. Uh, some people, the rapture is their savior instead of Jesus. And uh, very well said. Thank you for joining us today, Britt. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Like and share this uh, program with as many people as you can. You need to get the truth out. There's a lot of news out there, but people need to hear this about occupying and the hope that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you all. <laughs>